Let's hear from Michael Turner. Michael. In 1981, I had really long hair. You can look in the program and there's a picture of me, so there is proof that I had really long hair. And I was a young assistant professor and I was eager to make my mark. And being a theoretical cosmologist, what, what that meant was I had to come up with a clever idea about how the universe began and it would be good if it were true and could be proven true. But that's <laughs> not necessary to get tenure. It just has to be clever. <laughs> and I want to take you back to 1981. Uh, no email, no internet. Uh, we communicated by mail, and it wasn't called snail mail then. So it was just called mail. And that's how we got the news. And on October 14th, 1981, I got a letter I even have the letter right here from Cambridge, England, from Stephen Hawking. Is there anyone here who doesn't know who Stephen Hawking is? So here I am, a young assistant, good, no one. Uh, young assistant professor, a letter from Stephen Hawking, and he is assembling 20 of the world's best cosmologists in Cambridge for a workshop on the very early universe. And I'm invited, this young assistant professor, and everybody who's anybody, well, who would fit into the 20 is going to be there. So there were going to be hot young Russians there. And again, to take you back, I don't mean, you know, mail order brides, but <laughs> the, you remember the Cold War and all these Russian scientists couldn't get out. We would read their papers, but they weren't allowed to get out because th they might stay out. And so they were names and faces that we didn't know, and they were writing interesting things, and they were almost as smart as us. <laughs> and the goal of this workshop in three weeks was to figure out how the universe began. I know what you're thinking, and in their spare time, they can figure out how to do world peace and solve hunger and figure out how Hillary can get out of the... Uh, well, that comes later. Um, but Science doesn't proceed in a linear fashion. Sometimes it lurches forward, and 1981 was a lurch year, and Stephen knew it. And the lurch had to do with a really, really big idea. And the really, really big idea is that there are profound connections between the unimaginably small down here, the world of the elementary particles, and the mind-bogglingly large stars and galaxies and the whole universe. And so that was a very, very big idea, and that caused the lurch. Alan Guth uh, published a famous paper called uh, Cosmic Inflation, and he showed that some stuff from the micro world called false vacuum could cause the universe to go through an incredible growth spurt, and because of this incredible growth spurt, it would explain uh, the basic features of the universe today. Big, big idea. And so Stephen was banking on the fact that if you got 20 really smart people and me together, that uh, you could finish up all the details. Now, there was one thing that wasn't a detail. There was one really, really big problem that had to be solved. Uh, and that really, really big problem I call is how the universe got its lumps. Because Alan's, Alan Goose's inflation gave us a universe that was absolutely smooth. And in a smooth universe, you don't get stars or galaxies or us. And so you need to get lumps. And so the big question is, how did the universe get its lumps? So everybody got the big question? OK. And I thought I had, and it will sound immodest, but uh, I'm under oath here, so I have to tell the truth. I thought I had a really great idea. Uh, and that great idea was that the inherent graininess of the quantum world. Everybody knows about quantum mechanics and it's you know, fluctuating around and grainy and things aren't smooth. <laughs> it's New York, everybody's supposed to be really smart. Okay, so the quantum world, everything's grainy and uh, the, this <laughs> the clock is running, we've gotta get through this. <laughs> Pretend you understand. 
so it's grainy. The universe grows by this enormous amount. That's what gallon goose inflation does. And this graininess on the subatomic world gets blown up to the lumpiness in the astrophysical world. And so that was a really, you had to have been there. It was a really, really great idea. <laughs> And so I thought, if, if this is right, if I can work this out, I will earn my spurs and I will be deserving of that invitation to Stephen's meeting. And so the basic thing was to put this to math. That's what we do. You've got to put it to math. You can't just put it to words. And so I enlisted the help uh, of, of another young assistant professor, Paul Steinhardt. And so we worked very, very hard on this. And now let's go forward to June 1982 and we're arriving in Cambridge. And you've seen the picture of my tribe in the program. So we're kind of funny. We have some unusual ceremonial things that we do. And so we don't do small talk. We're not very civilized. We're almost feral. And when we arrive, <laughs> when we arrive at the meeting, the first thing we do, we don't make small talk. I dump in Stephen Hawking's lap. He's in the wheelchair, my paper on how the universe got its lumps. And Stephen doesn't say anything to me. He doesn't yell, that hurt. He has his assistant give me his paper on how the universe got its lumps. And then the Russian Starobinsky is not going to be outdone. And he comes over and says, no, this is how the universe got its lumps. And then Alan Guth, you remember him, the inflation guy? Everybody's heard of Alan Guth, right? Uh, we're not going back to false fa OK. Um, he says, well, I know it's a really important problem, and I know I can get the answer by the end of this meeting. So this is a very important problem. We now have three answers. We have one incomplete because the dog ate the homework. And the three answers that we have, they all disagree. And so Cambridge is a science town, and word spread that something important was happening, that this was going to be the showdown at the OK Corral that this big problem might, be get, might get solved at this meeting. And so I'm kind of nervous. Uh, but then Jim Bardeen, uh, an expert on lumpiness in the universe, I know you've all heard of him. Uh, his father is John Bardeen, the only physicist to have ever won two Nobel Prizes, came up to me and he said, I think you and Paul got it right. And that was, that was very encouraging. Now, part of the reason he did it is that we based our work on a paper that he wrote. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure, but that, that was a good boost. And so one of the th things about this that's really interesting is science is not sterile. Science is done by human beings, and it's, that's part of what makes it really fun, is that uh, humans are doing it. Scientists are competitive. Um, it's, Kind of a, it's kind of a, like a competitiveness in the idealized Olympics where we compete really, you know, we really compete, but it's fair. And so what we're all going for, the thing that we're all going for is the golden moment. Do you all know what the golden moment is? Where you know something that no one has ever known before. You know something about the universe no one has ever known before, and no one will know until you tell them. That's even better. Ask any scientist, that's even better than a Nobel Prize. Although, actually, I haven't gotten a Nobel Prize. Um, and if there's anybody in the audience who can arrange that, I'm happy to do the experiment. To... <laughs> so that, that's, that's what we were, were doing. But what was a little bit different about this is normally we do our work in private. We do it in our office, we do it at home, we do it while we're walking, we do it while we're eating dinner, sometimes we do it while we're having sex. We're, we're thinking about these problems really hard, but it's private, no one's watching. And, but here, we're all together. We're all living in Sydney Sussex College. We're eating together, we're sleeping together, we're sharing bathrooms. I mean, when I said we're sleeping together, it's, we're in a dorm kind of situation here. And so that, that made it a little more difficult, but there were also some, some good things about it. So Stephen put on a, a lovely, uh, we had some nice social occasions, even though we're socially backwards. Uh, we, we had a garden party one Sunday afternoon, and we played croquet, which is absolutely the perfect metaphor for what's going on, because those of you who know croquet know on the outside it looks very civil and friendly, and what's really going on is, you know, cutthroat competition. And so there I am playing croquet, and every time I'm, I'm knocking somebody's ball away, I'm thinking, take that, Stephen Hawking. And then you, 
And you too, Starobinsky, and Alan Guth, you're never going to get it right. But you don't have to say it, you're just doing it in the croquet game. But the highlight of the croquet game was my partner, a 12-year-old, charming young lady named Lucy Hawking. And I was so enthralled that after the game, the only thing I remember of that afternoon, besides knocking away the balls and saying, take that, Stephen Hawking, was going up to Stephen and saying, I would like to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. <laughs> and the greatest thing about Stephen, beyond, well beyond his intelligence, is his sense of humor. And so he gave me that smile, and he said, there is a very long queue. <laughs> OK, so back to work. Um, my moment of glory is to give a talk in Cambridge. It's going to be attended by more than the 20 people. Everybody is. And uh, there I am working on my talk late at night and a knock, knock, knock at midnight. It's Jim Bardeen. Do you remember him, the son of John Bardeen, two Nobel Prizes? You guys got it right. And he says, I'm not sure you guys got it right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing your feelings with me. Um, so I had to go to plan B, because he didn't say where the mistake was, and he didn't say he was sure. So I had to go to a plan B where the talk was more about the basic idea. I'm not going to do the basic idea again, because you all got it so quickly the first time. Um, and I, I kind of say, well, and we're, we're pretty sure about the answer, but here are the equations, and we're still working on them. So cut to the end of the meeting. Uh, very, very exciting meeting, and by the end of the meeting, uh, sort of a miracle happened. Uh, all four competitors, using very, very different methods, and we couldn't understand each other's methods, nor did we want to, because we were rooting for the other people to get it wrong. By the end of the meeting, we all agreed. And none of the answers were the answer we had at the start of the meeting. And then the part that sort of ties in with toil and trouble experiments go wrong, while all four of us agreed, with each other, we disagreed with nature. If there was that much lumpiness in the universe, instead of getting galaxies, the universe would be filled with black holes. But there is a happy ending, because a couple of weeks later, we came up with a very small fix, and indeed this worked. And this meeting had lived up to Stephen Hawking's expectations. This is where the conceptual foundation for the cosmology you read about when you're not reading Jane Brody uh, in the Science Times came about at this meeting. And there was a happy ending for me also, because about uh, nine months after this meeting, oh, nine was a bad number, uh, uh, less than a year after this meeting, I got tenure, I got a haircut, and I had to convince my students that the two weren't related because they thought I had sold out. <laughs> so let me uh, end up by fast forwarding to December 2007. And uh, by this time, our idea of how the universe had gotten its lumps had really been well verified by experiments that you've read about in the Science Times uh, at the South Pole uh, with satellites called the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, or to its close friends, WMAP, had measured the small variations in the cosmic microwave background that verified that the lumpiness in the universe came about uh, from this quantum graininess. So Stephen invited the 20 back and invited a couple of hundred other people to come to this meeting to, to celebrate. And at this meeting, instead of being the young guy trying to earn his spurs, um, Stephen asked me to give the uh, closing talk. Um, I think he did it because I was almost his son-in-law, uh, but I'm not sure. And it was an interesting meeting. Um, some of it was disappointing because there was a lot of what I would call Rashomoning. Are you familiar with that verb? So a lot of the people who were there gave their version of the events, and there was one common feature of their version of the events, was the rest of the world was kind of peripheral. And so uh, I had a moment where I had to make a decision. Giving the final talk, I would have the absolute last word. And so uh, I could, I could tell you what I told you tonight and, and kind of get myself in the center. Um, but actually what I realized in, in a moment of, uh, of uh, reflection and just fondness for this fantastic meeting, what I realized is that this great accomplishment took a village. And that's what I said. Thank you. <laughs>